Hello. Good evening, everybody. I'm afraid it's me again, but only for, only for two minutes, and then the plenary will begin. I'm just going to remind you again that it's really important that you vote in the election. It, people are voting, but it's a bit slower than we hoped it would be, and we're a bit concerned that maybe you know, you, you're, you're putting it off. It does close at 7 o'clock tomorrow evening. If you're having any difficulties, it is really, really straightforward, as long as you can log in as a member. If you're having any difficulties at all logging in, please go to the, to the, to the desk uh, beyond registration tomorrow morning, and they'll sort it all out for you. But it, it really is important that people vote and work out, you know, who's going to replace me and who's going to make sure the organisation keeps running so we have another conference in two years' time and, you know, all of the things we do for members still keep happening. So please don't forget. Good evening. Good evening to everybody. Welcome to this second plenary. I know that most of you had a very intense day. And I also know that if you are here now, it's because you're looking forward to more stimulating um, intellectual stimulation. So um, yesterday, we reflected about neo-populism. We reflected about um, this rethinking borders from a coloniality perspective. Today we have uh, different contributions that I'm sure they will provide us with new food for thought. We have two excellent, outstanding scholars and they will be inviting us to rethink about pathways of hope. So you don't want to listen to me because you want to listen to our guest speakers. Uh, so let me introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Michelle Lamont. She's Professor of Sociology of African and African American Studies and Robert Goldman, Professor of European Studies at Harvard University. She's also the current director of the Weatherhead Center of International Affairs at Harvard. She served as president of the American Sociological Association and chaired the Council for European Studies. Her fields of expertise include topics such as culture and inequality, racism and stigma, academia and knowledge, social change, and successful societies. Please join me welcoming Michelle Lamont. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to participate in your conference. It's a real honor, especially given my deep desire uh, to debalkanize American sociology in the sense that this discipline is simply too big to know how parochial it is. So I'm trying to do this in part by uh, talking with you in in, as a way to strengthen the bridge uh, between American and European sociology. I also want to encourage you to engage with American sociology more because these disciplines, these uh, sociological communities certainly do not communicate enough. I think there's tons of really interesting uh, research happening here that, would, uh, benef that should be known better in the US. It's also a thrill to share the podium with an old friend, Nassar Mare, just remind, remember that we have known each other since 2005, and uh, we're both studying hope in the European context, so it's interesting to see uh, this convergence. So the lecture concerns um, some of the current challenges that our societies are facing and how to find a way forward. So I will build on two lectures that I gave over the last two years. One is the presidential address I delivered to the American Sociological Association in 2016, titled uh, Addressing Recognition Gap. And I, I also gave the annual British Journal of Sociology lecture last year. And I think that together with today's talk, these three lectures are taking complementary tack 
to address a set of interrelated questions, and they all aim similarly to develop an empirical sociology of recognition and stigmatization processes, which is part of a larger interest I have in the study of cultural processes. In a paper I published in Socioeconomic Review in 2014, titled, What is Missing? But more practically, urgently, theoretically, and um, in terms of social change, I want to ask ourselves, you, me, how to broaden cultural membership. And I consider this to be an extremely urgent problem. So the focus is our neoliberal advanced industrial societies, which are marked by a narrowing of criteria of worth and dignity when being worthy increasingly means being economically successful, which is associated with a rigidification of symbolic and social boundaries with growing xenophobia, as I will argue. I'm not going to talk about popular populism or uh, the growing popularity of conservative and right-wing parties, but I believe that the changes that I'm describing are really feeding these trends in the US as well as Europe. It's not the whole explanation, but it certainly is part of the explanation. To address the situation, I will argue that one of the things we need are new narratives of hope that can extend cultural membership to the largest member by promoting a plurality of criteria of worth, by reframing stigmatized groups as more worthy, and by publicizing ordinary forms of universalism or everyday cosmopolitanism that are often used by people who are not college educated, people who have not read classical political theory. But we also need to understand how to produce and diffuse alternative criteria of your of word in a, in a context where the public domain is now dominated by the social media. I think we don't understand anymore very well how the public sphere is produced, and I think that's one of the urgent tasks. Some of what I'm going to talk about are things that I'm still figuring out. I'm on leave this year and plan to finish a book on this topic, so you'll have to bear with me if not everything is worked out. I want to express very clearly that the solution I'm focusing on have to do with the transformation of the public domain. Of course, it doesn't replace you know, changes that have to do with economic distribution. But since economists are talking about economic inequality night and day, and cultural sociologists are partly well equipped to talk about stigma, dignity, recognition, that's what I'm focusing on. It doesn't take away the importance of thinking about distribution of resources. And I also want to clarify that I'm not in search of a single collective myth that could re-energize our society. Instead, I believe what we need is a societal conversation about the way forward, and that us social scientists who are studying the production and the diffusion of meaning are partly well uh, positioned to try to stimulate such a discussion, which is, I don't think, happening uh, at the broader level. So the first part of the talk is a diagnostic, and it focuses on the uh, neoliberal scripts of worth, uh, the negative effect of these scripts of worth on the, across the class spectrum, from the top to the bottom, and on the rigidification of group boundaries. And in the last part of the talk, I'll turn to the solution. But first, I want to say a few words about social resilience. And here I'm drawing on the collective work of the Successful Society programs, which I've directed with Peter Hall, the political scientist, since 2002. And we co-published uh, in 2013 a book titled Social Resilience in Neoliberal Era. And the kind of resilience we're interested in is not the one that has been promoted by conservative government, but uh, by its focus on uh, capabilities the capacity of, of groups to be all they can be. And this is enabled not, my focus is not individual grit, it's not the capacity of individuals to pull themselves by their britches to overcome challenges, it really has to do with the way in which in societies uh, provide uh, people with buffers, with scaffoldings on which they can draw to uh, you know, be all they can be in the Marxist sense of the term and the thesis for Feuerbach sense of the term that you know, we can be many, many things. 
Um, so this, uh, cap these capabilities are enabled, and we are in our book partly concerned with the role of institutions and in cultural repertoires. Institutions send messages about who's worthy, who belongs. An example of this is after the adoption of same-sex same marriage by 32 American states, there was a drastic decline in a number of LBGTQ youth who tried to commit a suicide in high school. So these laws provided them uh, the message, you belong, you're worthy, you're part of us. And uh, the institution did that, but also the discourse that surrounded it. So that's the kind of buffers or scaffolding that I'm interested in. And I want to think more generally about what kind of cultural institutions and cultural repertoires can be created, put in place uh, as tools that uh, can be uh, activated to provide a broader definition of worth that all of us could meet, not only the upper middle class. So, um, I'm not going to talk at great length about neoliberalism because I know that uh, a lot have, has been said about this. Um, but please keep in mind that the focus is not on individual grit. I focus on hope because hope is a kind of repertoire. I, I'm playing with the title Hope is a Rope as a title for the book because it feels aspiration, especially when it is intersubjectively shared or supported. So I think here, for instance, of the work of the medical anthropologist, Catherine Panther Bricks, who uh, finds that children who live in the refugee camps of Lebanon are much more likely to do well if they have at least one adult with whom they can share a sense of what the future is going to be like. So this capacity to, you know, phenomenologically defining future in a way that seems more real because it is uh, shared makes a real difference. In the American context, the main source of hope that Americans have had for a long time is the American dream. It has been an extraordinarily powerful engine for most of the 20th century. It has been a hope machine that has been remarkably effective at appealing to the hearts and minds to orient action and define behavior. For instance, it provided Americans a sense of direction uh, to their action. The answer is you should build prosperity. Standard by which we can define who belong. The answer is the successful or the potentially successful. A notion of who deserves to be trusted, those who try, and a definition of which group are stigmatized, the lazy and those who lack self-reliance. So now many experts of inequality, many social scientists, maybe the majority of American social scientists, continue to be fixated on the notion that we should all be middle class, that we should all get a college degree, become professional and managers, and enjoy the time of consumption or the quote unquote comfort level, I like this expression, that is accessible to the top 20% of the population. But most of us overlook the simple fact that 100% of the population cannot be squeezed in the top 20% of the income distribution. This is a problem. And it is partly a problem when you face growing uh, inequality. I'm not denying the fact that there's a lot of advantages of all of us to become upper middle class, but it's not gonna happen. In contrast, I'm, I'm gonna argue that the American dream is a bankrupt ideal that needs to be replaced by other narratives of hope. Narratives of hope that are, in fact, available to all, not pretend available to all. So neoliberalism has spread uh, rapidly since 1980, primarily in the US and Europe, uh, dating roughly, as we all know, from the election of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. So this figure here diff documents the diffusion of the term based on the LexisNexis search of online a newspaper in US from US and uh, Europe from 1978 until 2017. And you can see a very rapid increase, especially in the last five years, with the biggest bump from 1686 to 1714 in 2015-16. So we also uh, see that the term is equally present in the US and Europe, which was not, you know, which surprised me. So here, building on the chapter by uh, Peter Evans and Bill Sewell in our book on social resilience, 
we approach uh, neoliberalism as manifesting itself at four levels, at the level of the economy, market fundamentalism, as described, uh, for instance, by Peggy Summers and uh, um, Block in, in their important work, the role of the state in uh, uh, regulating the market in such a way that market mechanisms are functioning as freely as possible, the audit society that all of us academics have become victim of, but most importantly for my purpose today, the script of the self, which tells us who's worthy under this neoliberal regime. And the script of the self, as we analyze it, focuses on four aspects or five aspects. Self-reliance, the privatization of risk and individualization, that Ulrich Beck has written uh, about. The uh, competitiveness, a good person is a person who embraces competitiveness and uh, related attributes such as entrepreneurship. The pursuit of material success and social status as well as uh, meritocracy. In my previous work I have not included meritocracy but now I'm including it because it justifies inequality while grinding it on uh, individual merit and it reinforces the salience of all the virtues that are associated with uh, the American dream with a focus on material success, competitiveness and the like. So while I don't have measures of the diffusion of these values, um, I draw on the work of one of our graduate students, Jonathan Misch, who was until recently at LSE. He produced this uh, slide, which you probably cannot read, but it basically documents the increase in a belief, popular belief in, in meritocracy across a number of Western societies. And what it shows, essentially, is that it grew in all but five of the 23 countries that it considers. It declined only slightly in three countries, Austria, Canada, and France, but it increased in the 15 uh, other countries. So this, you know, to the extent that meritocracy is associated with the justification of inequality, uh, it is uh, one piece of evidence of the growing spread of uh, neoliberal uh, values. There are others that I won't be discussing now. So for the case of the US, there's plenty of evidence that support for the American dream remains very high despite uh, growing inequality and despite the fact that this growing inequality is you know, constantly covered by the media. So um, there's this belief. Uh, so why is this belief so strong? Well, Americans put everything under the American dream, going from having a good family to being able to ride your motorcycle without a helmet, to uh, pursuing economic achievements. So the dialogic character of the term contributes to its uh, popularity. Uh, increasingly, the uh, surveys show us that people think that they are going to succeed even if the society as a whole is not uh, as equal as it used to be. There's this belief in individualism. And it's partly popular among immigrants and the non-college educated. And I think one of the reasons why these groups are expressing such a commitment to the American dream is the fact that believing in it has become assimilated with simply celebrating American national identity and signifying one's cultural citizenship. Yet, this American dream is quite pernicious. Why? I think that with the diffusion of the neoliberal scripts of self, it is leading to more rigid uh, symbolic boundaries. Basically, it tells us that, and it's not what it says explicitly, but I think it's a message that is carried implicitly in what we consume in entertainment media, for instance, that the upper middle class, which is associated uh, with competitiveness, socioeconomic success, and self-reliance, is the most worthy group, the group that everyone should be aspiring to, and that culture is being diffused uh, uh, systematically through the media. I'll provide data in a second. In this context, it means that the working class and the lower middle class and the, work, the poor who are perceived as being uh, less self-reliant are becoming more stigmatized. And this has ripple effect for all the groups that are associated with the less self-reliant, those who are presumed to be taxing the collective resources, the health service, uh, social security, et cetera. Uh, in particular, ethno religious and racial minorities and immigrants, especially illegal immigrants in the American case. 
So, uh, and I would add to this refugees. So I would argue that these neoliberal scripts of self feed this class bifurcation by growing the recognition gap. And one of the side effects has been the proliferation of movements seeking recognition, not only left and right wing populism, but also all the other social movements that have received a lot of attention in recent years. So now to speak briefly about how this American dream is screwing everyone from the top to the bottom, uh, I'll start with the upper middle class, the alleged winners. Well, they're not really winners. Uh, uh, I have a lot of evidence, but I don't have much time. I will simply mention this growing mental health crisis, which uh, those of us who have teenagers have been experiencing up close. So what does it mean for the adults in this upper middle class? Um, there's a very a great increase in uh, depression and anxiety between 2005 and 2015. This is uh, present in, across uh, several age groups, but especially among non-Hispanic -His whites. And it is, uh, there's a significant increase for those in the lowest annual household income group as well as for those in the highest annual household income groups. And basically the pursuit the frenetic pursuit of money and work are viewed as common sense of, uh, of uh, stress as all parents become obsessed with reproducing their social position, with passing on privileges, buying expensive private school for their kids, hiring uh, private tutors, college counselors. They all become uh, helicopter parents and uh, they think that, and they have very little contact with others, other social class as symbolic and social boundaries are now being consolidated around spatial boundaries. So this declining uh, physical contact or you know, neighborly contact with people of other classes uh, leads them to lose perspective in what are their, uh, their privileges. In this context, we also see a major mental health crisis among the youth. A very, I'll just show you this, this graph here. It's a UCLA freshman uh, survey that has been ha conducted since 1985. With the blue line is the number of uh, students, freshman students, who feel overwhelmed by all that I have to do. So the, the evidence is very, um, converges. All universities are expecting, are experiencing the fact that the mental health services are absolutely overwhelmed. The kids don't know how to handle pressure anymore, in part because they feed, they, they have a lot of pressure uh, from their parents. So this uh, insecurity that has increased considerably since 2008 is creating, is, you know, one could think it's ridiculous to think about uh, the the downside of this moment of growing uh, inequality for the upper middle class, but you know, and it, this, it is a fact that this group is not particularly well served by this uh, ruthless pursuit of, um, of success. So despite its obvious flaws, the lifestyle of the upper middle class is repeatedly offered as a model to everyone so there's a study conducted by sociologist Richard Butch. He did a content analysis of 400 primetime American sitcoms, totaling 68 years of television, where he found that 90% of all the characters in the sitcoms were either upper middle class professionals and managers or working, uh, or working class people. And the working class people represented only 10% of their characters in this 90%. And their, per, their presence had increased by only 1% over the last 10 years. In the vast majority of cases, uh, the working class men are presented as buffoon, and you think about The Simpson, for instance, as uh, incompetent, immature, ignorant, and irresponsible. Only their kids are smarter than them. A parallel analysis conducted on a sample of television programs presented in Sweden uh, has very similar conclusion. In this case, this sample included 32% of American programming. So this exposure to rags, of rag, to rags to riches stories in entertainment television serves to strengthen belief in the American dream. This type of entertainment has ex increased exponentially in recent decades. Think of all the reality TV show in particular, the, the wives of Beverly Hills, etc. So a student of political communication, Unji Kim, has shown that watching such a program, such program has a significant effect on believing in the American dream, 
particularly among Republicans and those who are politically optimistic, and it has an impact as strong on the belief of the American dream as being a child of immigrant. So this may suggest that much of the entertainment television operates as a gigantic uh, publicity machine for the distinctive uh, scripts of self that are associated with the upper middle class and with neoliberalism. The working class simply does not find its reality reflected in entertainment television. Then we can talk about the working class and the poor, but I don't want to spend too much time because I think I'm already you know, a little bit behind. I will simply mention that in this uh, 2000 book, The Technique of Working Man, for which I interviewed uh, black and white workers in New York and white and North African workers in France, I found that American workers were much more likely to think of themselves as losers than their French counterpart, and they drew very strong uh, boundaries toward African Americans and the poor, l uh, lumping those two groups together, whereas in France the strongest boundaries were toward uh, Muslims. Interviews conducted in 93. Uh, together with my colleague uh, Nicolas Duvou, we did a uh, reevaluation of these theses based on the more recent literature on the transformation of symbolic boundaries in France. And we found that the French poor were now equally vilified, as it was the case by Americans, with a lot of uh, pressure put on them to become more self reliant. Nicolas wrote a book titled The Autonomy of Welfare Recipients in France, which also studies that. So transformed quite significant convergence in the symbolic boundaries in, uh, in uh, France and uh, in the US. Um, and there's also similarities when we look more generally at uh, the transformation of uh, symbolic boundaries across Western Europe and Eastern Europe with uh, weaker boundaries toward the poor in Western Europe as compared to Eastern Europe. But in general, the situation is um, suggest that people in the bottom, bottom half uh, are doing worse. This is even worse, of course, when we consider the poor with the spread of extreme poverty. And uh, the American working class, uh, recent studies such as Andrew Cherlin, demonstrate that they are increasingly isolating themselves. Men who are not able to be providers spend a lot of time in their basement on the internet. Fewer of them marry, fewer of them are participating in uh, associations such as the Knights of Columbus, and of course there is the opioid uh, epidemics that uh, Angus Deaton and, and, and Case have written about, which is just devastating this group. So all this suggests the need to create, to rekindle new uh, narratives of hope that are uh, distinct and available to all, not tied to economic resources. Uh, these transformations are at the same time bringing about a stigmatization of groups that are associated with the stereotypes uh, of a lack of uh, self-reliance. So it is true for ethnic and racial minorities and uh, immigrants and LBGTQ. Just a very sna quick snapshot here from 1993-2006, uh, you see a great uh, decline in the feeling of warmth toward blacks, especially uh, among uh, Republicans, and toward Chicano and Hispanics, and uh, toward illegal immigrants. Uh, um, gays and lesbians are not uh, experiencing the same decline, although since Trump's election, there are great many changes that have brought about a greater you know, a, a hardening of boundaries toward this group. So this is basically the snapshot, and it's not very hopeful, as you can see, but history marches on. Human beings have always looked for hope, so I think we need to look for hope. Uh, as I was working on this paper, talking with my colleague about sources of hope, no one could see any hope anywhere, but you know. Anyway, I'm sure not that many, I don't know if many of you are hopeful, but anyway. So, what can we do? I think, you, I'm sure that uh, in Europe, in the UK as well, you have a lot of uh, psychologists working on pro-social instinct, human nature, uh, tribalism, the tribalist instinct. Well, one day I'll write a very uh, stern critique of this literature. I think they are missing a lot of what mobilizes group boundaries. Our group boundaries are actually changeable. And that's partly what I want to talk to you about. 
So I have several solutions. Some of them I've discussed already in the papers that I've mentioned before, but some of them are slightly new. One, I think we need to look at millennials and Gen Z to understand the new worlds that they are creating since they are not buying into their parents' pressure for success. We can also look at how groups that have succeeded in becoming destigmatized have done it. We can look at how the non-college educated think about what makes people equal. And finally, I think we really need collectively to attack uh, how the public domain is put together today. And if any of you are studying this, please let me know. So uh, the Gen Z, all the literature shows that instead of uh, simply pursuing uh, economic prosperity at any price, some of them emphasize that, but there's also a lot of emphasis put on authenticity, inclusion, sustainability. This is not coming from nowhere. Here again, I believe we can look at the role of agents of change in cultural industry and social media. Uh, the television, the series that are most popular with this group, such as Orange and the, is the New Black, Transparent Girls, these are programs that feature trans character, inclusive character, it's a generation that defines itself very, very differently when it comes to who they want to connect with and the role of diversity in their friendship. Not across all social class, but I think that we look, we need to look very systematically at how the advertising industry is doing this. For instance, uh, I was interviewing a woman named Jessie Weiner, who is the person behind the Barbies that have now seven different tones of skin and phenotypes, so this is a major revolution. And the, the, the soap Dove, which advertised um, soap by using a woman of all size in their underwear. So these are examples of everyday representation of who, who is worth being seen and how the, the, the things we consume should, should reflect uh, who we want to be. So those are examples of how a plurality of, of uh, criteria of evaluation should be mobilized. It's also happening by employers who are, for instance, uh, putting in place uh, programs uh, uh, for uh, family uh, and work balance that, that give uh, parents the chance to uh, take time off to take care of their children, acknowledging that we're not only uh, workers, but also parents and friends and caretakers. So we can look at the engineering of these changes as they unfold. When it comes to understanding the stigmatization, uh, I, together with some students, we wrote a paper looking at the group that has been most destigmatized in recent years, people with HIV AIDS, far more destigmatized than the obese. And the big difference had to do with how uh, health and medical uh, experts and other knowledge experts were able to mobilize their knowledge uh, in collaboration with social uh, uh, movement activists to destigmatize the groups and diffuse different frames to which to understand these groups. So by understanding better the processes of destigmatization, I think we can also move toward more pluralistic understanding of criteria of worth. Then, finally, I want to mention uh, this study of North African immigrants living in France, where uh, in the context of the book, The Dignity of Working Man, I interviewed a number of them and I asked them what makes people equal. And I was very surprised to see the range of uh, evidence that they pointed to me, very few of them had to do with, you know, the standard precept of French republicanism. It didn't have to do with their direct relationship with the state, but with things such as we're all children of God, biologically we all have ten fingers, we all spend ten months in our mother's womb. So I want to call us social scientists to more systematically talk with people who are not college gifted to understand how they think about equality, similarity, compatibility between types of human beings, so that these uh, findings can inspire us better as we strategize about how to bridge uh, group boundaries and think in terms of uh, political strategy. And finally, I think as, a collect as an intellectual community, we need to think much more about how uh, successful s uh, narratives take off and how they can be diffused. Diffusion doesn't operate at all today the way it used to with the massive uh, consumption of, uh, and use of social media. So I think that all of us, you know, not only sociologists, but experts, psychologists of emotion, neuropsychologists, 
uh, experts in religion, we need to work together to think much more systematically about the diffusion of different kinds of repertoires of worth. And uh, where is hope in this? Well, it's the ability to give hope to everyone that they can gain cultural membership, even if they are not uh, upper middle class or do not, uh, are not partly uh, self-sufficient uh, economically. So the conclusion is, and here I'm speeding a little bit because I've talked too long, is that uh, as we're thinking about the challenges that our societies um, are facing, I want to uh, claim more space for us sociologists in, uh, the, in setting uh, the public agenda and in filling uh, newspapers with our analysis. I think the vast majority of the commentary has to do with uh, economic inequality. Of course, there's a lot about identity politics. A lot of it is negative. A lot of it is progressives uh, attacking each other doing moral boundary work, I think we need to think far more systematically, drawing on our tools as social scientists about how stigma, dignity, recognition unfolds, and uh, that we need to figure out how to broadcast our knowledge so that as a society we can think collectively about how to deal with this beyond putting crazy people in power, and we need to mobilize our social science knowledge to uh, broaden cultural membership. Maybe this is a little bit utopian or too hopeful, but uh, I don't know what better answer there is. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for these challenging words uh, for us as sociologists. Um, so now we want more. So, our next speaker is Nasser Mir. Uh, he is professor of race, identity, and citizenship at the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Edinburgh. He is the principal investigator of the Horizon 2020 project Glimmer of the governance and local integration of migrants and Europe's refugees. He's also editor-in-chief of Identities, Global Studies in Culture and Power. His work focuses on issues of citizenship, identity, and the politics of multiculturalism, Islam, and the interplay between race and religion. Please join me welcoming Professor Nasser Mir. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Good evening. Um, can I begin by adding my thanks to the organizing committee, the conference team, and of course to you all for remaining here at the end of a long day to hear a second plenary. I don't know what the collective noun is for a large group of sociologists, but it's, uh, it's good to be in your company. Uh, so it's quite late for social theory, so let's see how this goes. So my talk is entitled uh, Cities of Hopes and Cities of Fears. And what I want to do is explore how cities have a unique role in the incorporation of displaced migrants and refugees. But I also want to caution against a kind of methodological localism that I think prevents us from seeing this as a multi-scalar activity, something that I'll try to elaborate with empirical work from a number of small and medium-sized cities that we've been working on. Each of the cities that I'll refer to are known for leaning against exclusionary state policy or practice. But my argument will be that this doesn't prevent them from reproducing those exclusions. And yet we are sometimes prevented from seeing that if we only focus on the local initiatives. So I'd like to start, if I may, with the story of Domenico Lucano uh, and note how it must be a strange predicament to be banished from the city of which you were once mayor. So is the status of Lucano, a once local teacher and the mayor of Riace in the south of Italy. Mimo, as he's known to Riacians, early this year met the full force of the anti-immigrant politics of Matteo Salvini and the Liga Party, presently in coalition until yesterday, uh, with Salvini, of course, serving as, admin uh, as interior minister. The underlying reason, the town of which Mimo was mayor, led pioneering schemes from the early 2000s to incorporate displaced migrants and refugees. His mayoralty founded an association, the City of the Future, inspired by the Calabrian utopianist 
uh, Tommaso Campanella and secured some modest funding which allowed them to successfully incorporate people seeking refuge into local labour markets, but in ways that regenerated not only previously abandoned quarters of Riace, but the very sociality of Riace itself. And in so doing, to some extent, it decentered the city or staked a claim for reimagining the space in a way that didn't peripheralise displaced migrants and refugees. Precisely what Lefebvre characterised both as the abstract claim to city life, as well as the concrete claim to the spaces of work, leisure, education, healthcare and accommodation that should be shared by all urban dwellers. An important point is that even though these people may not have had formal legal status, they nonetheless had a right to the city. Notably, and in addition to national level politics and policy, the Iriachi model was explicitly set against the Calabrian Mafia, who continued to exploit migrants and refugees in agricultural labour in particular, where picking fruit for 12 hours in 40 degree heat is normal life, and with other coercion and violence, provides a case study of modern day slavery only a couple of hours flights from here. The Riace model, as it became known, was exported, as I'll discuss, to other nearby towns and cities in the south of Italy. But I begin with this story because it's related to other examples of city and local level governance that's operated in the face of national level intransigence or closure. The International Cities of Refuge Network, the Cities of Sanctuary, the Save Me campaign, the Eurocities Network, are all illustrative of what I describe. In each case, we can observe a recrafting of pre-existing social imaginaries in ways that elevates the capacity of cities to foster new forms of solidarity. Yet, as I'll discuss, our enthusiasm in the study of this can overlook how cities are also sites in which global and national exclusions are enacted and realised locally. This pushes or leans against something enthusiastically described in the social science literature as the local turn or methodological localism, something that can downplay situations of interdependence. Yet I don't wish to deny that there's been something distinctive underway, seeing the role of the local in general and the city in particular amongst responses to the so-called refugee crisis, where civic society especially has been a force against racialized social closure. The local is therefore a space in which the relationship between civil society and governance becomes a vantage point to observe forms of capital, social and other, at work in migrant and refugee incorporation, including that generated by migrants and refugees themselves. In this scenario, and whatever the national framework of immigrant and cooperation policies, insists uh, Ambrosini, the urban level needs to be appreciated as a policy-making field in and of itself. I think this is evident in what Mariam Hasselbacher has called emergency governance, the immediate arrival response, the longer-term embeddedness of which I think remains uncertain, but relies equally on the particular character of the city in question. Now, there's a number of features of this tendency that I'd like to elaborate. To get to this, I'd like to spend a moment just sketching out our existing sociological tools to conceptualise relationships between migration and the city in the global north. Uh, I'll then discuss some current and ongoing work from our project Glimmer. Uh, this includes the governance dynamics around the key question of housing and accommodation in the conurbations of Cosenza in Italy, Glasgow in Scotland, Malmo in Sweden. Now, these are all what Glick, Schiller and Kagler may term low-scale cities for so they assume a weak position in global exchanges and are or were dependent upon particular industries or sectors. Yet these cities matter too to this story, and I'd like to elaborate why. And then I was going to say I'll offer some final conclusions we've been discussing questions, but there are no questions, so this is more like a sermon than a, than a presentation. So how do we characterise the role of migration in cities? I managed to catch Michael meet Keith this morning before he headed off, and I said I was going to do this, and he said, oh, it's impossible, you can't characterise the role of migration in cities. Let's we'll see how it goes. Well, it's a mighty task to which a number of people have contributed, including, of course, here. That being so, and when I was asked for an abstract for this plenary, I returned to a working paper by Zygmunt Bauman, who started to develop an account of what he termed cities of fears, cities of hopes. It's a cliché to say that cities are places where strangers meet, and yet this for Bauman is where, and yet in this for Bauman is where the fears of change are and the hopes, conversely, of what these might bring. Both, he argued, are related to the same impulse and reflect how the city and the social change are almost synonymous. Change is a quality of city life and the mode of urban existence. Change in the city may indeed should be defined by reference to each other. Now, as I think is perhaps true of a great deal of Bauman's later work, uh, Bauman and ESA plenary in 2015, of course, um, was openly reflecting on a long-standing and weighty literature 
of cities of which he too was a student. A literature that spans disciplines, methodologies, scales of the micro, the miso, the macro, questions of agency and structure, matters of community and capital. Any historical account of this literature would include Max Weber's typology of city generating factors, which came partly in a rejection of Zimmel's characterization of the city as a contingent outcome of its cumulative size uh, and scale, um, cumulative size and scale of corresponding social relations. One feature of Zimmel's broader account, which is of course very influential, and a flagstone of Kingley Davis's later formulation of urbanisation as the expansion of a city's population in relation to its total national share. Now, of course, it's with the new dynamics of urbanism that both Zimmel and Weber were grappling, but for Weber, size alone certainly could not be decisive. To build an ideal type for the present, and not untypically, he looked backwards to the medieval guilds that combined economic enterprise, religious activity, as well as private and public life, something in which community, he felt, was progressively deteriorate, uh, deteriorates with the onset of capitalism. Now, of course, like others in this room, I'm you know, critical of a Weberian or an unreconstructed Weberian dominance in sociology, especially where it sets um, parameters around the sociological endeavour, um, specifically in thinking about state, rationality, and of course, modernity more broadly, a critique very eloquently made by others here, including Gaminda Bambra in a further ESA plenary a few years ago. This is no uh, less true of Weber's compartmentalising of the role of colonial projects in the rise of urban Europe overlooking the dynamics and routes between imperial cities and colonial cities in both urban planning uh, and the movement of people. I don't think this means, though, that Weber's typology of the city is without sociological purchase, spanning as it does markets, social relations, and bureaucracies. Uh, and with some kind of clumsy discomfort, I think in each of these modes we can locate some important examples of the last 25 years that uh, our work is kind of pushing against. On markets, I think Sassin's global city has probably been one of the most influential uh, of contemporary discussions, and in which global cities are studied as financial market centres and as sites where the command structures of global capital are geographically decentralised but not devolved. Taking London specifically, Doreen Massey elaborates this through her focus on deregulation, financialisation, commercialisation of all aspects of life that results in a more unequal city. I think what I'm missing from these kinds of accounts is what Glick Schiller tracks, I quote, as the transformation of human bodies into a commodity to be bought, trafficked, or stored by multiscalar agencies, including det detention centres that are part of the process of accumulation through dispossession. These two are the hallmarks of the development of urban space in neoliberal terms, which includes a kind of a double displacement of marginalised populations and their replacement with economically mobile populations with often greater consumer potential. Indeed, regeneration processes often rely on the construction of the refugee to pathologize targeted locations with racialized and class-based discourses which attach a particular kind of territorial stigma to both people and place. And I think it's in this mode that we need to locate some of the more Panglossian statements about the capacity of cities presented in places such as Barber's popular tract, as Mayor of the World. This is one, in my view, very unfortunate reading of the administrative and legal capacity of cities that I want to lean against by emphasising specifically how refugee services and infrastructure are taken not by cities but by international and multinational businesses. On the role of dwellings of Faber's typology, we might think about the literature on the everyday, including Back and Sinner's uh, recent book, The Migrant City, or Susan Hall's study of a single road in South London, which showed the transnational character and points of departure which spanned the formerly British Empire. The point being in all of this that migration too is a city generating factor and needs to be understood as such. How and in what ways varies. The historical growth and expansion of cities as well as their role and function of processes of development has conditioned the production and direction of migration flows. At the same time, migrants, migration, continually reshapes the city, uh, the urban life, and so contributes to the wider processes of change so cherished by Bauman. Yet all this is subject to the particular character of cities. Clusterman makes this point in the discussion of what they call cognitive cultural urban landscapes, what I understand to mean how specific cities lend themselves to types of opportunity structures for migrant entrepreneurship. From a very different perspective, Lee's discussion of poor cities is another, including the relationship between low-income, casual labour and migration, and how this has been central in forging welfare cities. I want to slightly pivot on this, uh, to observe not how the city is often a means of grasping at migration or vice versa, 
but how both the literature on the city and the literature on migrant negotiations of it understudy the role of governance, especially the governance of displaced migrants and refugees. I think this is an urgent question for sociology. This is where I would argue Bauman's Cities of Fears and Cities of Hopes is most stark, something that traverses the everyday, but also supposedly high-level policy concerns. For it's in policy governance, no less than in the multiculture of urban life, that the boundaries of the city are forged. This includes how city governance seeks to deter migration rather than facilitate entry, especially displaced migration, let alone pursue various strategies for integration. And it's in this area that I think housing is crucial. An interest in housing and settlement, of course, is as old as the study of cities, and some of the early features of this work continue to structure some of our prevailing assumptions. For example, the Chicago school School's characterization of spatial distance being the same as social distance. In the present, refugee accommodation and settlement processes are a contextually rich means, I think, of gauging this, including the forms of vertical and horizontal partnership that emerge between different kinds of stakeholders. Now, whether there's an emerging literature addressing the housing and accommodation trajectories of displaced migrants and refugees, it's often material which is very single case focused um, or very ethnographically driven, both of which I think are real assets in understanding um, the migration uh, asylum nexus. Less well established are the multi case, multi scalar policy governance accounts charting contemporary developments. So, taking an approach which spans the north and the south of Europe, I'd like to add to this. Uh, and I'd also like to add to, rather than reject, what's sometimes called uh, a national model explanations uh, by discussing this work at a multiscalar level. Uh, although our urban areas in Glasgow, in Cosenza, in Malmo are broadly comparable in terms of their size, their experiences with migrants and refugees differ considerably. Recent displaced migrants have accommodated, been accommodated in Glasgow, for example, since the middle of the 20th century. However, in the main, this was achieved through a managed refugee resettlement program, which brought small numbers uh, of recognised refugees to Scotland. This changed significantly when the UK Labour government initiated its dispersal scheme, which was intended to share, quote unquote, the accommodation of asylum seekers across the UK, effectively shifting populations from the southeast of England. To date, Glasgow has been the only local authority in the whole of Scotland to have participated in the dispersal scheme, and it's estimated to accommodate up to 2,000 asylum seekers annually the largest intake for any single authority in the UK. Malmö and Eslav in Sweden, meanwhile, are two municipalities in the Scania region, as well as part of the Oresten region that connects Sweden to Denmark and the European continent. The distance between the municipalities is close, only 20 minutes by train, but there are key differences. Malmö is the third largest city in Sweden, located on the border with Denmark, whereas Eslav has a smaller city centre, as well as a rural conurbation. In contrast, Calabria in Italy and Cosenza um, has become a place of almost uninterrupted arrival, with a number of displaced people amounting to about 5% of the regional population. This follows long periods of internal emigration outside of Italy as well as to the north. In each, the short-term and long-term housing provision has been a window into the governance processes that can traverse, negotiate, acquiesce, and resist what is pursued at national levels. Now, of course, what is short-term and what is long-term are not questions that stand apart from wider migration experiences. Um, those experiences of formal and informal status and the variously conceived ambitions for integration therein. A key sector of most formulations of integration, housing is in many respects the cornerstone of the needs of displaced people. Now, any discussion, I think, of home as something greater than housing tips into that rich literature which, following Aftal Bra, recognises the idea of home as a lived experience of a self in a locality. As Phillips put it some years ago, perhaps more than anything else, the housing conditions and experiences of refugee clearly play an important role in shaping their sense of security and belonging and have a bearing on their access to healthcare, education and employment. What needs to be equally self-evident is that accommodation is often used as a deterrent rather than a facilitator of incorporation or integration. The locality and the quality of accommodation, the triage nature of its provision or refusal, the temporary tenure of contracts, the forced evictions, all speak to this. What were Kant termed organizational desertification, the restriction of networks to prevent social support, is also abundant across our cases. Now, in all of our case study sites, this can be a feature of an asylum-seeking journey, something that often begins with a process designed to hold new arrivals in locations distant to eventual accommodation. In Calabria and in Cosenza, 
Asylum seekers and refugees are initially housed in extraordinary reception centres, in caste centres. We've been to these. Um, but then they're moved to the SPARA system, which is a protection system for asylum seekers and refugees, which is made up of a series of projects, local projects, that collaborate with the third sector, the private sector, the local authorities, and are premised upon a commitment to labour market participation. That is, to, in effect, a scaled-up version of the Riace model. It builds on this kind of existing decentralised reception network involving municipalities and third sector organisations that have been in place since the late 1990s. And since then, the Italian SPARA system came into being in 2002 officially as an Italian Ministry of Interior funded collaboration, the very ministry of which um, Salvini is now uh, the head, uh, alongside a uh, national association of municipalities. In the SPARA model, local authorities which choose to participate in the network apply for a short three-year grant for projects that aspire to span labour markets plus education, um, civic life, uh, and something else. Uh, recent political changes, however, have thrown the SPARA model into great uncertainty, especially its capacity to move beyond temporary extraordinary reception. Until the Salvini decree, um, asylum seekers passed through reception centres and were assigned to a spa system, irrespective of their formal status. Now, asylum seekers remain in a permanent state of first reception because only those in receipt of a refugee status can leave the caste centre. Now, it's too early, I think, to anticipate the consequences of this and specifically how Italian cities will respond. But it's widely recognised that the reception um, solution is inadequate compared to the good practice of the SPARA model. And at a deeper level, of course, it's hard not to see this as expanding the function of reception centres as sites of exception, to borrow from Agamben. The bottom-up approach of Calabria is most obviously contrasted with a more top-down approach in Malmo. A 2016 national settlement law, for example, makes it mandatory in Sweden for all cities to receive refugees and organise their housing. In this fashion, the numbers of refugees received by the city is suggested by the Swedish Migration Agency, but the decision on the form of reception is made by each city, and is related to the size of its existing population, prior experience of refugee incorporation, and labour market opportunities. Malmo in particular brings a multi-scalar into view because the city-level approach cannot really be understood without appreciating the function of the national-level welfare regime, something that's embedded a kind of um, solidarity across which local practice either moves or doesn't move. Equally, it's important to note that many arrivals settle themselves without any state or local control. And that large majority um, of cities organise settlement long before they're encouraged to buy um, by the state, by the central state. Now, that relatively straightforward picture um, becomes immensely more complicated in Glasgow, in Scotland. Here, asylum seekers in need of accommodation are allocated on a no-choice basis. The accommodation provision made available through the dispersal scheme has created competing and complex governance interests that are exacerbated by a kind of a multi-level um, character, um, where at the Scottish level this comes into conflict with UK level welfare restrictions and immigration rules. Here, responsibility for both the dispersal scheme, which oversees the accommodation for asylum seekers, and the sponsored refugee scheme, which oversees the resettlement of sponsored refugees, um, up until recently, uh, principally Syrians, is ultimately held by the UK Home Office. The schemes rely on two diverging formalised arrangements between the UK, the devolved government, and local government for their implementation. The provision of dispersal accommodation, which was once managed through a direct relationship between the Home Office and participating local authorities or the City of Glasgow, is also part of a profit seeking non state actor relationship. These routinely profit from accumulation through dispossession. The privatisation of these dispersal contracts has not only removed the day-to-day -day provision and administration of housing um, away from local authorities, but also their policy competencies. So the type of the type of location, the size of location, the size of the accommodation, and the, and the standard and the quality are not under the control of Glasgow City Council. As a result, Glasgow City Council tell us that there's very little policy consultation with them, and so they feel very removed from this process which happens in their city. Meanwhile, the gaps that this approach creates, especially the creation of asylum, refugee, destitution and homelessness, is entirely picked up by the third sector and the charity sector. 
uh, and a series of organised grassroots networks. These cushion and counteract the aspects of this exclusionary national asylum policy and to some extent therefore morally question those policies in and of themselves. But it means that neither the City of Glasgow nor the UK government are primary actors at the moment in the accommodation of displaced migrants and refugees in that city, which is remarkable, I think. So the degree bringing this together, I think, to which what I've been describing um, that might be characterised as part of a longer development of what Brenner previously characterised as a rescaling of statehood. In this view, there's kind of a decoupling between local and national levels. Scholars such as Marburg characterise it as a as local governments shifting from a, 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 a passive to an active role. Now, I think this is to ignore the historical role and status of cities, to misdescribe the governance at play. What I think has been underway and is underway is not solely about incommensurability between the local and the national, between the city and the state, but about the meshed nature of those dynamics. Yes, cities and local authorities are not merely sites for national level processes to filter down. They have a distinctive and historical role to play in the design and the implementation of policies and programs. But these dynamics, I think, are easy to overstate. And I would guard against this kind of simplistic assumption that the local can address the limitations of the national. Indeed, in our findings, local level room for maneuver may often be very, very limited or very partial in the area of refugee accommodation and provision. No less significant, the evacuation of the national from the local can leave the latter incapable of providing either elementary provision, preventing homelessness. At its strongest, we might heed Emelson's insistence that cities are by definition ultimately always subordinate. I'm not sure that this is right either, but I agree with Filomeno that no model of governance, be it city, national or global, should be reified and explained on its own terms. For these reasons, I caution caution against a kind of methodological localism that ignores the multi-scalar policy dynamics and overlooks how cities are sites of closure too. And I would kind of finally argue for sociologists of the city to engage much more with the form and the content of policy governance, uh, which seems to me to be a, as essential a concern with societal encounters as the matter of the everyday. Because as I've tried to show, I think it's in policy governance no less than the habitus of, of urban life that the boundaries of the city are forged. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you to both of you for these inspiring and insightful uh, words. Um, I want to thank Michelle uh, for because she made a diagnosis, but also said that from sociology we can contribute solutions with this, uh, no? analyzing this narrative of hope, successful narratives that already exist in society that can reduce stigmatization and inequality. So a lot of for think, and thank you also Nasser for this uh, no? also insightful uh, um, development that makes us think that sociology, we study things like migration, but behind that there are people, real people, that with the live experiences, and this matter for our analysis, we cannot forget that. Um, Nasser, there's no time for questions, but I know that many of you would like to talk to them. If you see them around, stop them. They'll, they like to discuss a lot from everybody. I want to, uh, to thank all of you uh, for being here. I, know that we are all going with a lot of uh, our brains, with a lot of ideas burning now that we'll bring to our debates tomorrow and the day after tomorrow because we still have a lot of things to do in the conference. Thank you very much for being here.